art nerds, today we're taking a look at Karen Dosh's fan color gouache or tempera pans. Keep watching to find out. So I ordered this 15 pan set of Karen Dosh's fan color tempera or gouache, we're not sure yet, colors from the place where all good things come from, Amazon. It arrived promptly in this lovely metal tin and it is plastic wrap. You guys might remember me taking a look at Karen Dosh's gouache studio. They are strikingly similar. If you want to see the review for this, you can click this card here to check it out. We're mostly going to be taking a look though at fan colors today. And something I find quite interesting is in some places, like on Amazon, it's referred to as tempera paints. Other places, such as the Karen Dosh site, it's referred to as gouache. And that makes me wonder, what is the difference between these fan colors and the gouache studio? Hopefully we will figure that out today because the internet is proving inconclusive. So I'm gonna go ahead and slice this open. Karen Dosh's fan color line also includes watercolor pencils and water-based markers. And this is aimed at younger artists. I kind of have a feeling, although this is not yet verified, that the gouache studio is the same product, but marketed for adults in the US. I've noticed that European art supplies tend to, the stuff that's aimed at children tends to be rebranded in the US, marked up, and then offered to adults instead. I guess they assume adults in the US are not gonna buy nice art supplies for their kids. So the box is in every, every, <laughs> almost, almost every language, but English. Easy to use, requires no preparation, plasticizer free. The gouache comes in an assortment of 15 colors. The secrets linked to its ant manufacture ensure its, ensure its superior quality. It will not crack, and thanks to the strong density of the colors and the square shape of the blocks that fit perfectly with the shape of the paintbrush, it is easy to use and requires no preparation. And the back of the box has a really, really cute illustration. Inside are 15 pans. Fan color is only available in a 15 color set as compared to the Studio Gouache, which is available in eight and in 15. And the inside of this box is a little bit nicer, or at least it seems like a little bit nicer, and I can actually remove the tray if I so desire. So just for some quick comparison, because we all like to know what we're getting into, I'll pull out my Studio Gouache palette as well. They look strikingly similar. Yep, very, very similar. Same size brush. I think they might be the same product, but there's only, well, there's a few ways we can find out for sure. One of them is the internet. Again, the internet is not telling me the difference between these two and the other is to figure it out for ourselves. So a little bit of information about these fan color gouache or tempera paints. High color density and unbeatable creamy texture ensuring immediate ease of use. Plasticizer free formula so it does not crack. Contains 14 color tablets, one tube of white and one paintbrush. This is a synthetic paintbrush in a size eight. The application is recommended for budding artists with an unlimited range of color mixes. So younger artists, newer artists, aspiring artists, maybe older people who are looking to get back into art. This could be great for all of them. Um, they suggest that you can use this both heavy, thick, creamy, like a gouache, very watered down, like a watercolor. The techn technical description is water-based paint with a natural binder and no plasticizer. Water soluble. A plasticizer would be something like acrylic, used in acrylics, for example. High pigment concentration, luminous colors, good light resistance, economical to use. Practical, ecological metal box. Complies with CE EN 71. Warning, not suitable for children under three years because there are small parts. And to be fair, 
Sometimes these look like delicious candies. Techniques, opaque and transparent painting on paper or cardboard, easy to mix, water soluble. So these are a little bit harder to find. The fan colors are a little bit harder to find in the US. Um, you can definitely get them on Amazon and they're $27.61 for the set of 15 total colors. Compared to the Studio Gouache, also on Amazon, same number of colors, probably the same product, is $33.80. And this arrived to me, arrived to my studio toot suite, so there was no additional time. So, I did a little bit of digging online, just so we can talk about it. Wanted to know what the difference is between gouache, tempera gouache, and tempera. Gouache is opaque watercolor of the type used in gouache painting. Watercolor and gouache both consist of the same basic ingredients. You have a natural or synthetic pigment. So quins, like the quinacridones, would be the synthetic, whereas lapis lazuli or, um, even charred bone would be your natural. Gum Arabic binder, like this. This is gum Arabic and it is plant derived. I believe it is from the gum acacia tree. And preservatives. The major difference between the two paints is that the particles of pigment and gouache are larger and the ratio of pigment to binder is higher. Most gouaches also have chalk as an op optical brightener added to the formula to increase opacity. Like watercolors, gouache is available in tubes, pans, and pots and can last for years when stored properly. And again, the binder in this is usually gum Arabic. And I found that information on Plaza's What is Gouache blog post. And I have all of this linked in the description below. Tempera is a pigment um, like a powdered color mixed with egg or glue. Those are traditionally how you would mix tempera. In fact, the Renaissance artists frequently did paint with tempera paints um, or milk. And that would be like a casein binder. Um, it's most used for children's art because it's cheap and you can wash it away very easily. But once it's dried, it's gonna have a water resistant film. Hence why the Renaissance artists were, you know, would use it. Um, Whereas gouache is a water soluble opaque paint. So gouache never becomes truly water resistant. Tempera eventually does, if it's truly a tempera. And the binder for tempera is usually egg or milk. So I'm guessing these are probably just gouache. They probably have the gum Arabic binder. And I found the information about tempera on Quora, how do watercolor gouache and tempera differ, and on the wet canvas forums. And again, I'm linking all of those things in the description below. So inside our little packet, we have a fan color mini brochure, which details the range of products. Again, these really seem to be aimed at younger artists. And it's mostly watercolor pencils, some pencils, a eraser, a sharpener, some chunky pencils for younger hands, the gouache, oh, see it says it's gouache right here. And then they also have felt tip markers, which you guys have seen felt tip markers before. So it seems like in this iteration, this is aimed at children artists, younger artists. The pans pop out. They have a barcode. Pans do not seem to be available open stock. The Studio Gouache is available in the pans, but it's also available in tubes. So if you prefer working with tubes of color rather than half pans or full pans, then the Studio Gouache line is the line you're gonna wanna look at. Now we're gonna take a look at how these swatch. I have here a block of fluid easy block watercolor paper. This is a cellulose based watercolor paper, very affordable and it is glued on two sides to kind of hold it taut. I also have a pigment based brush pin and I'm laying down some black lines so that we can test the opacity of these water or of these gouache pans. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let this cure for a few minutes. That way the pigment doesn't reactivate, it doesn't lift up. And then we're gonna begin swatching these fan color gouache pans. So that's had a chance to dry. Go ahead and take a look at all 14 colors. So this is the included synthetic brush. Gonna go ahead and just rinse out that sizing. I'm gonna try to get all 14 colors on here. 
and these colors aren't labeled. So later in, on in the video, I'm gonna try and dig up my best guess or the internet's best guess of what's included in this set. I'm also doing a full opacity test and then a wash opacity test because like you guys remember, these are supposed to work both as gouache and as watercolor. Although I will say that for adult art supplies, it can be fun for sketching and great for like urban sketching, that sort of thing, although the set is kind of big. Um, but it doesn't always work really well as, because of the optical brighteners, it just doesn't always really work for every artist. So that's just something to keep in mind. That if you really want a set that can do double duty, perhaps you should buy, um, colors that are traditionally more opaque or naturally more opaque due, the, due to the type of pigment, like yellow ochre would be an example of a color that is traditionally more opaque due to the pigments used. That doesn't mean these aren't a fine art supply for a child or just for sketching and for varied use. It just means it's not a one-stop solution to all art problems. And like with the gouache studio, I'm finding these are not as opaque as you would hope gouache would be. I may have to get another sheet of paper. I do, however, like the selection of colors for this. I also wish they included a lighter skin tone, just since it's gouache, it would just be easier to utilize, but it's really easy to mix skin tones from these colors, so that's a small complaint. But since these are already performing very similarly to the Gouache Studio, I may rehome my Gouache Studio set to someone else and keep the fan color. There's all 14 base colors. I'm going to test the white gouache now. And I still don't know why they include the white gouache in a tube and not a pan other than this might make for easier mixing. All right, so everything is pretty dry except for the white and some of the mass tones. And it looks like some of my hot pink polluted the ultramarine blue just a little bit. They're really not as opaque as you would think for, you know, a gouache alternative or something that is masquerading or claiming to be gouache. The colors are lemon yellow, yellow, vermilion, carmine, It says purple, but that is not purple. That is hot pink. Hmm. Yeah, I don't have a purple in mind. Okay, moving on. Brown, which is kind of a burnt sienna. Yellow ochre. Then like a spring green, a leaf green, that sort of a green. Emerald green, malachite green cyan, but it's not really a cyan. And to be fair, I am pulling this from an Amazon description. So I would say this is more like a Prussian blue or um, a blue green, like a phthalo blue green shade, that sort of thing. Ultramarine, I would say this is their magenta. Then gray, black, and our mixing white. So how do these compare the, to the Karen Dosh Gouache Studio. So for this demonstration, I am going to do a one-to-one -one comparison. As you guys can see, my Studio Gouache gouaches are kind of gross. They're kind of dirty. So I'm gonna try and clean out some of the color pollution before I swatch, just to make sure we're getting kind of a, an apt one-to-one. -one. So we have here a warmer yellow. And this is from Karen Dosh Studio Gouache. And we're gonna take some of the warm yellow 
from the Caran d'Ache fan color. So Studio Gouache is going to be on the left and fan color is going to be on the right. Next we have a orange, red, vermilion, scarlet, red sort of color. That is the Studio Gouache. Now I'm gonna grab one or the same color or what seems to be the same color from fan color. It actually seems to be a little lighter. Next is, I think that's a magenta, but it might be their dark red. I'm gonna clean that off really well. Yes, that's nice sort of true magenta, a little bit of purple to it. Now we're going to do the fan color. Ooh, that is actually much brighter. Now we're going to do the blue included in the Studio Gouache set. So it's kind of a phthalo blue green or a phthalo blue green shade. Now we're gonna grab similar color from the fan color. Next, we're gonna use the emerald green and I'm cleaning these off as I go. And that's Studio Gouache. Now we're grabbing the same color from Fan Color. Next, the gray from Studio Gouache. Now the gray from Fan Color. Finally, the black. All right, so that's just a color comparison. Now we're gonna do the same thing to test opacity. So I've got a black pigment based brush pin. We're making two lines. We're gonna stay consistent. The left is going to be the studio gouache. The right is gonna be the fan color. All right, so I'm gonna start by just working my way down the studio gouache lineup. I'm gonna try to get these as opaque as possible. I am noticing there's a couple of color differences between the eight color studio gouache set and the 14 color fan color set. Well, I guess I should say 15 since they're counting the white. But the tubes of white seem very similar, just slightly rebranded probably for the two different markets. And considering white pigments are fairly cheap, I think it might even cost more to try and source a cheaper option than to just use what you already have formulated in tubes, but... I don't know. I'm not the manufacturing expert. All right, so these are all Studio Gouache. Now we're gonna do the same. Oh, got some black on my fan color. Let me clean that off. All right, and on the right are all fan colors. So I'm gonna let all this dry and then check in with you guys. All right, so these have had a chance to dry. For the most part, the colors seem to be the same in both sets, at least for the eight colors. The only real difference I've noticed is the magenta-ish color in the Studio Gouache set is a little darker, a little dirtier. It's more like a red violet than the very hot pink magenta-esque color in the fan color set. But otherwise, they really seem to handle about the same. They seem to have the same kind of colors in the sets. I'm gonna try doing a radiated wash with each just to see if that's how they differ but otherwise it really doesn't seem like there's much of a difference at all so I need to pick color that's in both sets I'm gonna go with the phthalo blue-esque color and I'm actually starting with fan color this time and I'm using the round eight included in the box 
right, so that is the fan color. Next, we're gonna take a look at the studio gouache. Now the marketing for the studio gouache seems to focus mostly on the fact that this can be used as a portable gouache. And there's a lot of wonderful watercolor artists and gouache artists, even James Gurney, who are big fans of the studio gouache. So in my studio gouache video, I did do a little bit of a gouache-esque demonstration at the end. I think, however, for the fan color paints, I'm going to try and, and test both proposed properties. I'm going to try to do um, very light washes, layers, glazes, build it up to thick, heavy detail. Going back to the fan color. Basically just see if it has the range that they say it has and whether it really would be sort of a good middle ground for artists who are looking for something flexible like opaque watercolors. So at the top is the fan color and at the bottom is the studio gouache and I did a couple of layers on it just to kind of mess around with it a little bit. I'm gonna let both of these dry. All right, so Art Nerds, this has dried overnight. Again, at the top, fan color. At the bottom, studio gouache. These are the two sort of phthalo-esque blue colors. Since these are not necessarily... No, they do have color numbers on them. I guess they do have specific color names, but... These are the two phthalo blue-esque colors from this sort of pan here. They appear to be almost identical. So I think the only real difference between these two sets is the pink, and that could come down to just formulation differences. Might not be anything really noticeable. In fact, there may be some fan colors out there with the darker pinks and some studio gouaches with the lighter pinks, or maybe it's a reformulation. Not really sure. Again, here is our swatch sheet fully dry now of all the fan color colors. Again, the fan color gouaches come in 15 total colors, including the white. So when we did the studio gouache, we kind of treated it more like gouache and we painted a little thicker. For the uh, fan color field test, we're going to do a lighter layered painting and see if it still holds up. Okay, so we're going to put the Karen Dosh fan color gouaches to the test. I am going to find a floral illustration I thought that would best capture the color range we have. But I also wanted to try and do a little bit of color max match color mixing. That's the word. I wanted to do a little bit of color mixing just to see if the 15 colors we have available is really a good range and mostly I'm talking about skin tones, which can sometimes be a challenge and are certainly a challenge for me in gouache. I have to be honest, I have no idea where I lost you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of backtrack and I am really, really sorry. So I've been doing some color mixing, which is a shame because I mixed a lot of colors and I, like I said, I don't know where I lost you. I found that it was fairly easy to mix a variety of skin tones using yellow ochre, scarlet, burnt sienna, and even a little bit of black. As long as you mix in some white, you're gonna get really nice opaque colors since these kind of fashion themselves as a gouache. I also mixed a couple of purples, one using the hot pink with the ultramarine, the other using the carmine with the ultramarine. Um, I talked about the fact that I think you can probably mix any color you're looking for with this set and that I recommend that you get this set over the similarly priced eight piece uh, studio gouache set. So I'm sorry if that's information that was already covered and I'm even more sorry if you're looking at this and you're wondering how I got the skin tones because I know for some people skin tones can be really frustrating to mix. So I sincerely apologize for that. That kind of threw me like big time because I was kind of wrapping this up. Anyway, um, seems like a very mixable set. 
um, especially for if you know a little bit of color theory that can be really great if you're a teacher teaching a class I highly recommend you actually demonstrate the mixes and explain why to them so they can go and mix these on their own so they don't have to struggle with it um, I'm going to do the field test next. Now for my first demonstration with the Canon Dosh Studio Gouache set, I think these are the same sets, just rebranded. So I went very gouache with that demonstration. For this demonstration, I'm going to go lighter and I'm gonna go um, more transparent and we'll see if we can't um, do both light watercolor washes and heavier gouache like effects and i'm still going to work on a cellulose paper this is the windsor newton cellulose paper i got it in my march watercolor snacks and it's not really my favorite but it's also not the worst it has gelatin sizing on it which is something to be considered um and those of you who know what that means already have a preference so um I'm going to start painting on this and I've already pulled up some wildflower reference and I'm just going to sketch that in. But first I'm going to clean off my tabletop. So I went back and looked at the footage and it seems like I caught none of the color mixing, which is really disappointing. So if you guys are interested in seeing me mix skin tones or doing, I don't know, a person painting demonstration with the gouache side of fan color, let me know in the comments below. I am really, really sorry about that. I have no idea how that happened, but it happened and I uh, got to move on. So the, this is easy to clean up. Don't let this fool you. I don't know what's going on with the microfiber rag either. I'm just having one of those evenings, but this is one of the reasons why I also enjoy working on these craft mats. Um, I have an official Ink Essentials one, and then I have a knockoff one that I got off of Amazon, and I can link them for you guys if you like, but they are super easy to use, and I can do a lot of my color mixing on my tabletop, and it's great for demonstration purposes because it means I don't have to pull out um, a palette. I don't have to clean a palette. I can just clean off my desktop surface. The only problem is when you have microfiber rags that don't want to actually soak up the liquid, that can be a problem, but I really, like these sort of table coverings. I know they're not pretty. Um, I'd had a white, well, it was a clear Fiskars craft mat of the same type and it stained terribly. My table always looks super gross and dirty and I like being able to mix my colors on my tabletop. So I went back to these and I'm really happy I did. So I've got this cleaned up. Time for a fresh set, ugh, a fresh cup of water and then we can get cracking. If you guys are interested in other types of opaque watercolors, I have several other sets from Holbein's Shin Gansai watercolors to Pelican to uh, Grumbacher opaque watercolors. So if you guys would like to see an overview of that, let me know in the comments below as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started sketching. I picked a wildflower bouquet. I thought it would represent the colors we have and um, I just sort of make best use of the palette. And I enjoy doing floral sketching, so I'm just going to do that in time lapse for you guys. So the first thing I wanna do, I'm not gonna stretch this, I'm just gonna leave it as is, we'll see how that goes, is I kinda wanna do a nice, warm sort of background wash. And I'm actually gonna grab some other brushes since the eight is pretty versatile. Um, it's a good size for like kinda open, loose paintings. But I feel like my painting would get a little bit muddy. So right now I'm just doing a really wet wash on this gelatin sized paper. I didn't mask anything out. That might be a huge mistake. I might regret that. We'll see. Already the paper's starting to buckle. C'est la vie. Then I'm gonna 
spritz some areas and this will end up taking a while to dry and I may end up securing this. But one of the reasons I didn't secure this to begin with and I didn't, um, whatever, I wanted it to extend to the edges. I've been watching a lot of SAA, SAA instructional videos, Society for All Artists. So, oh, that's a lot of brown. And I know I tend to, in general, paint just kind of tight. Although they are usually smart and secure theirs. Just putting in a little bit and then I'll let this dry. So while it is still terribly, terribly bowed like this, I'm actually gonna try and do a little lifting without disrupting the paper too much. So I'm just using a clean, dry bit of paper towel and I'm just going in and kind of dabbing it in some areas. In some areas, if I leave it yellow, as nice and sunny as this is, it's gonna get muddy because I'm gonna be using blues. This is still somewhat damp, but it's for the most part dry. I'm going to go in now with kind of that darker, warmer color. And these are some of the more opaque colors as well. And I'm just gonna kinda dab them in because I don't want them everywhere. I just kinda want them to influence. And then I will kinda spray down here and over here. I'm just trying to loosen it up a little bit. So um, I know I tend to paint really overly tight, overly rendered. So the next thing I wanna do with this is I wanna start getting some of those greens in. And we've got what looks like a lot of kind of sap greens, so yellow greens, green golds. But they're darker too. So I'm gonna try to get it dark enough. Another nice thing about these craft mats is they're non-porous, right? So yeah, you can pick your colors up, but that's also really good for gouache. So I had, I'd originally bought some medical trays off of Amazon to use for gouache painting their gray medical trays. And I thought they would work really well um, for color accuracy, but they had a texture to them so that the medical supplies don't go slipping and sliding everywhere. And uh, that was not so good. So I'm just gonna dab some of this green in here while this is still sort of wet. I'm probably going to regret what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna spray it in a moment just to kind of get it moving. Cause I don't want this to be super tight. That's one of the reasons why I'm using a huge or several huge brushes. I want it to just be kind of loose. Possibly too loose. I'll come back and kind of clean that up a little bit later. This is definitely kind of opaque. Sort of spritzing it to get it to move around. I know I'm the problem with why it's so opaque. But it's still more opaque than I'd hoped. So I'm gonna have to try to get really loose with this to kind of make up for that. Then I'm gonna go back in while this is still wet and do a little bit of lifting. This is probably gonna get kind of muddy. We'll see. I'm not trying to lift it back to white so much, just kind of, you know, get, get it back a little bit lighter than it is. So I'm gonna let this dry as well. While this is wet, I'm gonna go kind of dangerous. I'm gonna grab some phthalo blue, mix it in with my green, and try to get it in some of these areas. And I'm using the size eight that came with this set. 
and I've painted, I've done, I actually used to do a lot of floral watercolor paintings on the Windsor and Newton cellulose based paper. One of the reasons I liked it is that I thought the gelatin sizing, which is surface, I mean, they have interior sizing and also surface sizing. Um, I felt like it kind of helped keep my greens a little more vibrant, which is nice for floral paintings, kind of kept my work a little more jewel-like. I also felt like for a cellulose-based paper, it stayed open and workable a little longer than some of the other inexpensive cellulose papers, because I was doing this for studies, so I wasn't really looking to invest a lot of money. like this brush for this. I might like this brush for gouache, but it is a very stiff little synthetic brush and I want something a little looser because I'm trying to go a little loose with this. So I've complained about this paper in the past, but it's actually not terrible paper. You guys have probably seen me use this paper and I didn't really make a big deal about it then. It's not bad. It just lends itself to specific uses more than, you know, other uses. Which I mean, that's watercolor paper in general, right? Like, not every paper is going to be your favorite. I thought it would hold up well to the sort of colors I wanted to use for this. And I honestly think it does. I mean, these are kind of just like preliminary, sort of wet into wet wash toning. I'm not really serious about anything yet. Mostly just kind of figuring our way out with these watercolors. So I want to do a yellow, nice warm yellow. And with my log, this is going to make the paper buckle. Okay, and then I want a little bit of this green in the middle, and I'm gonna do it wet and wet. Like I said, I'm working, trying to work really loose today, which you know you guys don't get to see me do too often. So want to kind of try and draw in because there's like these green stems, like bright green stems. I'm going to try and sketch them in. Sometimes I'm good at it, sometimes I'm not. But I really like the color they add. I think it makes things feel really bright and fresh. That's one of the fun things about using opaque watercolors is they, you can kind of go over colors and add new ones. You just don't want to do too much because that really will dull what you're trying to accomplish will dull your colors too much. You, you know, do light over dark too much, but just here and there is usually fine. And then next to it is a nice orange poppy. So mix up some orange and the center is yellow. So I'm gonna try and preserve the center. And I'm painting while everything is still kind of wet. Hoping to get some color, like a little bit of color play, which might not happen on this paper. Okay, and the center is kind of golden with a little bit of green in it. Knowing me, I'm gonna end up adding too much water and kind of ruining what I'm doing. Then there's another kind of orange, an orange brown rust colored blossom over here. I might be going too bold with that. So what I'm gonna do is leave a lot of the white of the paper, but also I'm gonna tone the color down a little bit because that's a lot in one spot. And there's like a more muted. I 
one over here. I just want to add a little bit of that color. And then, looks like over here as well. I'm going to mix a little bit of ultramarine and phthalo and hopefully get a nice kind of a truish blue. Being a little sloppy tonight, unfortunately. And then sort of hiding. There's like kind of an autumn yellow, kind of rusty yellow here in the foliage. And there's another around here. And then there's like a carnation with some pink kind of peeking out from down here. Doesn't really feel like it belongs, but it's okay. If it kind of helps the color balance, it doesn't matter. Put some in there as well. Grab some yellow ochre and some burnt sienna. Those are more opaque colors. Just kind of naturally, they're more opaque. Okay. So I made a mess. Something I've noticed about these is that they um, they they are they tout themselves or they are touted as like not requiring any preparation. And that is definitely true. They activate really really fast, and that can mean if you're trying to do more transparent glazes, transparent washes, you may end up putting too much down on the paper because even if you work with a really kind of wet loose brush like what I'm trying to do here um, you can end up just putting too much pigment down it's going to pick up as much pigment as it can so even if you're like working kind of loose and you're trying to be kind of light-handed um, it can still end up picking up a lot of paint and that's not necessarily a bad thing I mean for those of you who work really big much bigger than I do this could be really good for you because you know it's gonna be able to keep up with you basically you're not necessarily constantly mixing up new batches or reactivating batches you're it's gonna keep up for me I kind of work small compared to a lot of watercolorists so I'm having trouble keeping up with it actually now I've kind of saturated the paper, so I think one of the best things I can do is kind of step away and let it dry a little bit, because this is very wet. And... All right, so that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I always say that, and then I do like five more things, and sometimes it ruins it, and sometimes it saves it but I'm gonna step away and let this dry. Let this mess I've made dry. All right, friends, it has been 30 minutes. The paper is still wet. There's areas that are like visibly shiny and wet. What I'm gonna do is just ruin it a little further. I mean, I'm just gonna go into this area here with some yellow and yellow ochre and just kinda tone down some of the brown it's really supposed to be kind of a mustard color. It did not end up that color. Also going to go into this flower here and try to do a glaze. Although I will not be particularly successful. And then using Scarlet Red, I'm gonna go into this one. as well as this one up here. And I probably should have mixed some red in with that yellow and yellow ochre just to kind of resaturate it, deepen the color a little bit. But what I'm gonna do with this, rather than try to get it really tight in paint, 
is just kind of wanted to get gestural color down, which I think we did, even if it is a little bit sloppy in places. And I'm gonna let it dry and I'm going to tighten it up using a Pentel pigment-based brush pen. Now I am noticing, just as I kind of keep working on things, I am noticing that the colors are a little bit muddy and some of that is, again, my fault, over layering, et cetera. But some of it is due to the opacity of these colors and it's one of the reasons I ended up or I opted to work kind of loose because I knew muddiness was gonna be something I was gonna struggle with with this, with these. And that's due to the opacity of these colors. They activate quickly. They do have a fair amount of optical brighteners in them, which would be like chalk or talc, just anything that makes those colors seem more opaque and seem to pop a little bit more. And that's not the biggest problem, but it doesn't lend itself to glazes. It doesn't lend itself to sort of lighter washes of color, and it doesn't lend itself to layering, at least not in a watercolor sense. Maybe in a gouache or an acrylic sense, you could do that. So while I think these are still a great product for younger artists or artists who might have a lighter hand, these are not really a great product for me as a watercolor product. And um, I don't necessarily think they're capable of filling both needs. However, there are loads of artists way better than I am who feel differently, who enjoy this product, who think this is a fine quality product. So take what I say with a grain of salt. If you paint like I paint, um, or if you in general enjoy and trust my opinions, then this might not be for you. But otherwise, I highly recommend you check out some of the second opinions in the uh, outside resources and second opinions section in the description below and see what they have to say. And it could also just be a case of the paper isn't really working with this product. I might be just using the wrong paper for these paints. And that happens sometimes. So further experimentation might be beneficial and if I end up discovering a paper that I just absolutely love using these as a watercolor product on, cause that's what I'm kind of critiquing these for. Not the fact, not their gouache abilities. Cause I haven't really put either set to a full fair test, but just for their watercolor abilities, doesn't really do it for me. But I'm also not the biggest fan of opaque watercolors. I have a few, I use them, but I don't use them every single time I paint, for example. Okay, I tighten that up just a little bit, probably made even more of a mess with it. That's fine, we're here to enjoy ourselves, we're here to paint. I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna show you guys how to ink this with a pigment brush pen. So, I really don't like how this turned out. I feel like this is really muddy. It's kind of ugly, but that's okay because I am going to ink it and then we can be done with it. But I thought I would give the, I thought I would give the Karen Dash fan color, you know, another shot on a different paper and I still, I don't know, it's just as a transparent medium, it's just not transparent. It goes opaque very quickly. It gets kind of muddy quickly. So I know a lot of people like it. I feel like I'm probably handling it wrong, but you know what, maybe it's just not really for me or maybe I should use it instead as an opaque watercolor or as a gouache instead of trying to use it as a transparent watercolor because it mixes so quickly. It it activates so fast. I don't feel like 
I have a lot of room for the transparency and then it goes on really thick. Maybe I could use um, traditional, like uh, natural hair brushes instead of using synthetic brushes. The synthetic brushes might just be picking up too much pigment, but either way, it just didn't seem like it was a great fit for me like that. Switching papers did help because the paper I switched to is actually, it's a watercolor sketchbook from Hobby Lobby from years ago. And I actually don't really like it. So I'm actually, I don't know. I developed like a, a different style for me for watercolor that's loose and a little lighter handed. And uh, that's pretty much the only thing I do in that sketchbook is just those sort of watercolor studies. And that's actually one of my weaker examples of it. I can flip through that sketchbook for you guys if you like. I think I have a video where I flipped through it before. But every now and then I like using supplies that I'm not really a fan of in different ways just to force myself out of my comfort zone, force me to do something unusual or that makes me uncomfortable and that way I can't just always do the same five things. In fact, for these kind of loose sketches, I don't normally use a big brush pen like this to ink it. I usually use a 0.4 fine liner. Actually, let me, this is going to end up getting all up in that. So I might as well clean it up right now. But I usually use a 0.4 fine liner to ink it and I usually get, you know, finer details. But again, since this didn't really turn out the way I wanted it to, I thought it would be fun to maybe try something different, something a little more expressive, different line weight. Kind of like it like this. I don't, I still am not like a huge fan of the end result piece, but I like this better the way it's going now. It's also kind of just a nice break from my usually very tight mannered style that doesn't always work so well. So anyway, more about these fan color gouache slash watercolors. I found they layered muddy, overly thick. I had trouble getting kind of light transparent colors like over here. I think these would be great for a younger artist, especially if you want to buy said younger artist actual art supplies. You don't really want to break the bank, but you want something that they can get a lot of different use out of. These are great in that you can get really bold, transparent color, but you also do still have the option to do kind of thinner washes. They're not difficult to use. They don't require a lot of prep. Cleaning them up is very easy. In my opinion, there aren't a lot of good art supplies marketed at a younger audience that kind of fits all these needs, especially in the US, or rather particularly in the US. I know Europe and Japan kind of handle things differently than we do. So if you see these in person and you don't mind the price tag, I would recommend picking them up for a young person you love. And if you're interested, you might as well give them a shot yourself. All right, I'm gonna do the same now for this illustration here. And even from a failed watercolor, there's still a lot you can learn. And we have to have a lot of failures in order to have successes. So I don't let things like that discourage me. And sometimes in you end up learning a lot from seeing a failed or a botched piece through things you wouldn't have learned otherwise. 
so I don't know if it was me. I don't know if I was impatient because for these sort of watercolors, I don't necessarily do a lot of color mixing. I usually work from a fairly extensive palette and I just paint from my convenience colors. But I found the colors to be a little bright, a little kindergarten, if you will. Not that there's anything wrong with bright colors, but I was having a lot of trouble getting some of the darker, more nuanced colors that I would have liked for some of these pinks. That opera pink is very, very bold, and I'm not necessarily used to painting with a color that bold frequently. And the bouquet I painted for this illustration does have a lot of very bold pink, which is nice, but I feel like it took over this piece. And I feel like the colors are so saturated that they're distracting. I also had difficulty sort of mixing the sort of more muted whites and grays that I would have liked for this piece. And those should be some of the easiest things to mix, but I felt like I just really struggled with that, with this palette. However, I had a bit of a migraine tonight, so maybe I just didn't give this the time it needed. Maybe I just wasn't as patient as I could have or should have been. That's why I ended up painting it twice or painting two different bouquets using the same watercolor palette twice. I wanted to give it a fair shot. Especially since so many artists who I really re respect have a very different opinion of this palette, but they also have a lot more experience with it than I do. So maybe with time, I will come to love it as much as they do. They are also, a lot of them are also using it primarily as a gouache palette though. So I think even though this was important to demonstrate because on the box they talk about how you can use the Caran d'Ache fan color and the Caran d'Ache gouache studio for transparent watercolor effects. I really don't think it lends itself to that nearly as much as it does to nice, thick gouache sort of effect. So as a gouache palette, as a portable gouache palette, I think it's very successful and I look forward to playing with it more in that respect in the future. Though it's a little big for me for say plain air painting. It still definitely has a place in my studio. And I like that I was able to very quickly mix up skin tones. I wish I could have d demonstrated that for you guys. I regret that my, I didn't quite capture that. So if that's something you'd like to see, if that's something you need help with, or you just wanna see how I go about doing it, let me know that in the comments below and I'll do a follow-up video where we mix skin tones. And I may do one anyway, because I kind of want to do a video where I try to paint, paint a person or do something more figurative with these in a gouache usage, just because it's not really something I do very often. And I could certainly use the practice. And it's always fun playing with kind of alternate styles. All right, so I think I am about done with this, and I think I'm finished with the Caran d'Ache fan color review. I hope you guys found it useful, helpful, and informative, and I hope you'll also check out my Caran d'Ache Studio Gouache review, although I think they're the same products, I handle them differently. And I do a lot of the testing that I kind of skipped with this set once I kind of realized they were the same thing. I do a lot of different testing in that video. And you guys can find that by clicking the card here. If you enjoy watercolors, tip watercolor, tips, tricks, and tutorials, make sure you check out my watercolor playlist and check out my blog, natosoup.blogspot.com for reviews and more tutorials. If you like my watercolor art, I highly recommend you head on over to my Instagram and check out what I'm working on. And if you're looking for something a little more in depth, a little you know, more to chew on, why don't you check out my beautiful watercolor comic, 7 Inch Kara at 7inchkara.com and 7inchkara.tumblr.com. I hope you guys have a great day and I hope to see you again really soon. Bye guys.